right, welcome to episode 15 of the Bulldog Bark. I am yours truly, the guru. Got a whole cast today. We got Michael D. Rosa. We got Kyle the Butler fan. We got BFC. And we got our good old friends from the Big East Barroom, the brothers, Tyler and Ryan. Um, they are, in fact, UConn fans. So they will be giving us a nice little uh, preview of UConn's matchup with Butler tomorrow. Um, obviously this is a Butler podcast, so we are going to pump up Butler more than anything, but, uh, the dogs are coming off of a thrilling, absolutely thrilling 99 to 98 win, uh, at number 13 Creighton. Uh, I'm sure all of you that are listening, I watched that game. Absolutely insane. It's the first time Butler has won at Creighton, uh, in Omaha since 2015. Um, so a, a really big win for the dogs, put them on the map. Um, they are now, uh, in a lot of bracketologists um actually all the way up to like nine or ten seeds which is crazy to say when when the beginning of this year started so um i'll start with our friends over at biggie's barroom uh maybe tyler I'll let you start what were kind of your takeaways or thoughts after that butler game versus creighton the other night yeah i mean one of the most aesthetically pleasing games of the biggie season if you liked offense especially um you know two teams that really could get after it scoring at will a lot of talk this week about the college product had lost some um, of their momentum, Ryan, you know, had brought that up to me recently and, you know, have a 98-99 game go down to the wire. Um, I just think that if you're going to talk about this game, I really thought the unsung heroes of this game or, you know, people, you know, obviously we could talk about Telford and Davis and Pierre Brooks, but Finley Bizjack, um, you know, to get 11 points from Finley Bizjack. And I thought Landon Moore was excellent at times in this game um, with his, you know, they to get 20 points from those two players combined – if Butler has the depth to be able to do this, you know, and they make this tournament run, it will be, I think, because their depth will be tested. I think you know what you're going to get from the top three guys. So if you had told me before this game that Pasha Alexander wouldn't play and they would win at Creighton, um, they showed me a lot. This is really, you know, I wanted to see that one win where, you know, it all feels different, but I wanted to see that win where, it, you know, actually you could throw it out there and be like, this is our signature win. And I feel like Butler got it. And that's a fantastic win. Another name I'm going to throw out there is Bowden Kapke, who hit those two clutch free throws at the end of the game. Also a freshman on Butler's uh, a Butler's team. Yeah, the freshman stepped up in a huge way um, with the absence of Posh. And, and honestly, Jalen being knocked out early with those foul trouble. Um, just and even Augusto Casilla got some some action, which uh, he hasn't gotten all year and, and had the kind of day, game-saving dive in the ball. So absolutely. Uh, Ryan, how about you, man? Yeah, I think Tyler, you know, really hit the nail on the head in terms of the offensive efficiency. I mean, this was the highest level of shot making I've seen in a Big East conference game this season on both ends, really, which, you know, then says something about Butler's defense. But if we're focusing on the positives, the offense was just incredible. And specifically, Jamil Telfort, the way they attacked that uh, Creighton's weakness on defense as being the four, Jamil Telfort rose to the occasion. I thought it was a really interesting uh, dichotomy to the Xavier game where they really focused on attacking Xavier's four with Jamil Telfort and he didn't get the job done. I think he went like three of 14 in that game, ended up with 10 points. This was the opposite. He goes for 26 points, ties his season high and uh, is able to exploit that mismatch and lead them to um, the biggest win of their season, the second biggest win. What do you guys think? Uh, I, I think, uh, I mean, it's tough because I mean, I think Marquette's probably technically the biggest win just based on it's they're higher in most metrics. But um, I'd say aesthetically, it was really fun to watch <laughs> compared to the 69 to 62 Miss Fest that was on uh, on display at Marquette. Um, and to your point, it, yeah, it doesn't have to be all positives. You know, Butler is in Kempom. They're up to 47th. Um, now that's a little bit their 30th in offensive efficiency, but they are 97th in defensive efficiency. So clearly some some things to iron out on the defensive end. That's always been kind of the, the thing this year. Butler can beat you with offense. They can also lose just based purely on they can't get stops. Um, I will pass it over to some of our friends over at the uh, on the Butler side here. Michael, I'll start with you. Um, what were your takeaways from that game? Yeah, you mentioned Bizjack and Kapke both off the bench. Uh, I mean, in 37 combined minutes, they give you 19 points, five of six from three. Uh, and combined, according to the Kempon box score at least, Bizjack had an offensive rating of 182, Kapke 194. Uh, for those of you who aren't analytics dorks, that is incredible. Uh, that Those are unheard of numbers. So uh, 
off the bench, they had good production. And Jamil Telford, uh, you, I mean, Ryan and Tyler both mentioned it. He had an absolutely incredible game. I think he, I honestly, I thought he was the best player on the floor. All things considered, I thought he controlled the game on both ends. I thought offensively he hit a couple really clutch shots late. And when we're asking the question, which game for Butler was more meaningful, taking away like just metric side, I thought Butler played well in this game, definitely offensively and defensively. Uh, they didn't play well at all, but they were getting anything they wanted against Creighton's defense. And compared to the Marquette game where that one just kind of felt like Marquette missed shots, I thought this was the best game Butler had played all season to me. Yeah, to build off of that, um, and so I might have to actually confirm this. I think this is right, uh, that Creighton had the 12th ranked defense and it actually went down to 25th after their yeah. game against Butler. So um, Butler did that not to just – a good team, but to a great defense, which is, I think, speaks volumes to their offense. Uh, BFC, how about you, man? Yeah, I think that the biggest thing that we saw here, and it was the difference of what we saw last year, was Barlow is an NBA, he's an NBA coach. He's coached in the G League, he's coached NBA players, and he knows how to find mismatches, and they just didn't know how to counter it. Because Jamil Telford was going off the whole game. You know, you knew where the ball was going. They were either going to run that kind of baseline play to Telford, and he shot 70%. They just couldn't stop him. Or they were going to run that little pin down to DJ, and he was 8 of 12 from the field and 3 of 5 from 3. And they just kept going to the well because they couldn't figure out how to kind of get around the switch to the mismatch, or Ashworth just didn't know how to defend Davis because he leaned in and fouled him on a 3. And then Davis was getting literally anything he wanted. Um, so I think the biggest the biggest difference here that we saw was Barlow coaching like an NBA coach. I mean, they were running NBA sets, but then also just finding our best player, which we've been begging them to do all year. And I'm not saying that Telford's going to always be the guy. Pierre is one of schemes like this as well. It's just another example of the willingness to ride the hot hand. Um, and that's what that's what won the game because if you had you know a selfish team where okay, they go down and Pierre, it wasn't his game, but he felt like he needed to, you know, be the guy. Um, we don't win that game. So just going to the well and having a team that has willingness to to let who's ever eat and eat uh, was huge here. And yeah, Telford was just, he played like a grown man. He was the best player on the court, honestly, from the first possession on. Yeah, I, I think it was either Ryan or Tyler that tweeted that, you know, top five scores in the Big East. And there's not a single Butler guy on there for a team that scores so many damn points which I think speaks to what you're saying is you could shut down one of Butler's big three, but any of those guys are, can go off at any moment. Like it could be Pierre one night. It could be DJ one night. It could be Jamil. And when they're all going off, good luck. Like that's, that's, that's where you're in deep trouble. Uh, Kyle, yeah, when you get not... 40, Oh, sorry. No, no, I was going to say when you get, when you get 48 points on nine missed shots from Jamil and DJ, it is going to be a long day for any team. Um, but yeah, like you said, we just, and Thad's been saying it all year. You need kind of all three of those guys to play well, but if you have two playing at an elite level, they can they can beat anybody in the league, really. And I think that was the biggest thing struggling Butler out of the gate is that they had really DJ and Josh had a little bit. Of, I mean, DJ had a couple of those games go off, and we'll talk about it because that first UConn game. But then he had you know three three in the middle there where he kind of had some troubles. Uh, obviously, him and Ja have definitely turned back into like kind of that non conference form because Pierre was kind of carrying us a little bit during that time frame. Um, so now, yeah, you have all three of those. It's, it's a problem. Kyle, last but not least, what about you, man? Yeah. I mean, I think that something that, well, I think it was mentioned, uh, as far as that posh didn't play this game. I, I think that like, listen, I don't think anyone here is going to suggest that Butler, um, wins, doesn't win that game with posh Alexander. I think it's interesting to note that that game was 99 to 98 and Posh Alexander didn't play. I mean, there's a there's a real uh, possibility here. I, I think it's a real thing. I think that that Posh, you know, doesn't – he doesn't play, um, and your offense is ridiculous, best it's been all season. Posh has been part of great offensive spurts this season and driving kick, but I'm sure Creighton was really game planning for it, and it came at the last second. And I think that it ca caught them off guard a little bit. Um, I thought that – some of the way they were defending Landon and Finley at times is the way that one would defend Posh because, you know, it's really hard to prepare for one team for three games and watch film and then just completely switch the way you play. And then our defense probably struggled more than it would have uh, with Posh in the lineup 
for sure. I mean, I'm, I, I think that nobody would deny that we probably would not have given up 98 points with Posh in the lineup, you know, even to a really good offensive team such as Creighton. A couple of other things. I think we really took advantage of Creighton's weaknesses. They We took so many floaters in the lane. We took so many, like, 10 to 12-foot shots because Kalkbrenner is fantastic, but he plays drop and he really refuses to come out and, you know, leave his rim perch. Um and I think that Butler really scouted that well and was able to take those shots. Also, unless I'm mistaken, someone correct me if I'm wrong here. I'm looking at Creighton's Ken Palm page right now. Um, there are 362 teams in Division One basketball, correct? I, I believe there are. And Creighton forces literally the least amount of turnovers in all of Division One college basketball. Uh, 10.8 a game. That's 362nd. Uh, nobody who plays against Creighton turns the ball over, and Butler didn't turn the ball over. And um, I think that making teams do what they don't do well, um, not well, matters. And I think Butler's game plan offensively here was just fantastic. Uh, hats off. Until the end, I swear. The only my biggest thing might be: can we work on our inbound sets at the end of the oh, game? Yeah, I, I don't know what that is. It's and it was and it was actually very close to being a huge problem in that Villanova game too. We got very lucky. DJ got fouled before the inbound, and then we got really lucky that Posh. I mean, it was close. Yeah, he got probably nudged out of bounds, but we almost lost the ball in that one too. So I don't know what's going on there, but I mean, that was, I mean, that's, that's Butler basketball for you. They want to give you a heart attack by all, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a win or loss. They just want to kill you. Um, so obviously really fun game. The dogs are hot. They've won four straight. Um, but Hey, you know, there's no days off in the big East, especially this next game going uh, to, to, to UConn, the number one team in the country. They're the number one team for a reason. Uh, last time these two teams played in Hinkle, uh, it was a great game, actually. Uh, UConn came out 88-81. Butler had a, a nice halftime lead, but uh, UConn took over in the second half. This it, this was without Klingon, so that, that, is, that is significant. Um, he is obviously back, and it is in UConn. The spread for tomorrow was 16.5. I've seen it as low as 14.5, um, which, honestly, with the way that UConn beats people, you can call it disrespectful, whatever you want to call it, but they're just a damn good team. So it's it's really not that crazy. Um, I'll kick it over to our UConn friends first. Um, maybe maybe kind of a twofold thing. What's what do you kind of what, what are your thoughts, your general thoughts on tomorrow's game, and maybe what are some key matchups or um, points of emphasis that you think uh, for tomorrow's matchup between Butler and UConn? Well, I guess my first thought is that first game was so long ago that I'm glad you did a little recap for me because, God, that feels like it was like last season. It does, yeah. Point. But that was a great game, and Butler did control it for large portions, and UConn uh, even made a huge run in the second half in order to come back. Um, this is going to be a really tough matchup for the Bulldogs, you know, coming to Connecticut to play the number one team in the country, you know. It will require something special, but in terms of matchups, just to piggyback off of what we already talked about, UConn's weakest spot defensively is their four. And we've seen that across the Big East is trying to attack Alex Caravan defensively. Now, Caravan's held up pretty well this year overall. But when you have Donovan Klingon and Stefan Castle and, and some of the guards who are elite defenders, Caravan is the guy who maybe is exposable. And Butler happens to have potentially the best power forward in the conference with the Bryce Hopkins injury. So that's the matchup I'm watching. I bet you Thad Matt is going to attack it early and often and see if he can expose it. And uh, I absolutely – is there any updates on Carabangs? I know there were some questions about his health. I saw, health I saw today um, that he's practiced – they said close to full participant the past couple of days – and I've been like just gauging the UConn fans on Twitter and stuff. And I think most people expect him to play. I think he might get limited run. We'll see. Um, I don't know. I think that Butler's probably game planning for Caravan to play. Yeah. I want to also be very clear to everyone because you're not going to be able to see us. Michael is currently playing with just about every single <laughs> filter that is possible on this, on this Zoom. So um if you hear a giggle or you hear something like that is because, I mean, he just had shades on. Now he's in a TV screen, okay. an old school TV screen. I don't know what's going on, but, but, and, and, and Ryan, I feel like you were being kind of kind there and it's okay to be very candid. Um, you know, I, I agree. I think going into Connecticut is just a very tough task for the dogs. Um, they just to some games out there recently, like Xavier came to UConn and they lost by 43. 
when this team's on, they are the best team in the country. I mean, they are, even when they're off, they're still one of the best teams in the country, right? So um, no doubt it can be a tough task, especially with clinging down low. Tyler, how about you, man? Yeah, so one of the things that strikes, struck me when we were talking about Butler, about how any player can beat you, I kind of have Butler as like a UConn light right now in that way of UConn has four players on any given night that can beat you on the floor, um, you know, with Newton, Caravan, Spencer, and right now between Castle and Kling, and I'll count that as one, ex, you know, one player. Um, I was going to say that Stefan Castle it has turned a lot of heads. Ryan talked about how long ago this game was, but I remember now that Castle played really well against you guys. I mean, had 14 points. So Stefan Castle has become our best defender at UConn, um, perimeter defender. So I'm interested to see there. Um, I will push back a little bit on Ryan. Yes, Caravan is the one of the worst. Def- he's the worst defender on the best team. So, I mean, he's won a national championship while being a starter. And he's off to a 19-2 and two record while being the starter. So if it was like a huge issue, I'd be like, all right, this is where you're going to go. Caravan will hold himself accountable. And I think he'll be fine if he's able to play. Um, yeah, the Butler team's going to need to go out there. And they're going to need to shoot really well. Um, you know, UConn can give up a three sometimes and that's about it and hope that Donovan Klingon gets in foul trouble. He gives, he's averaging, I think six th- uh, fouls in big East play right now um, per game. You only get five per 40 minutes. I'm sorry. Um, you only get five. So the fact that he is fouling out pretty much of every game um, is a problem right now. And he's not able to see the court. And that's where I think UConn is a huge advantage. I think because Klingon is just a lot bigger than Jalen Thomas. So um, they need to keep him on the court, but if Butler's able to get him out, they have a chance. And, and you're correct with the Castle comment. He was, per Kempom, he was the MVP of that game. I do remember he hit a three in that game, and I was so pissed because he, we all know that that's not really his specialty. And I remember he hit one, and I was like, yep, it's just his day. Like, we're not stopping that. I think, I believe they scored like 52 points in the second half or something like that. It's something ridiculous. Um, so Butler is going to have to iron out whatever they saw in the second half because, like I said earlier, Butler can definitely beat you offensively. They can. Like, they, but that's what Butler does. They score points. But oh boy, some, you know, that defense, <laughs> oh boy, sometimes, right? It's like, okay, yeah, even if we score, I mean, I posted something today about their record versus top 25, they're three and two, and you look at the scores of the games that they lost, it was like 91 to 86 to FAU, and then 88 to 81 to UConn. So those are high scoring games, right? So uh, unfortunately, that's that's the reality of the of where they are. But let's, let's punt it over to some of our Butler guys. Uh, Michael, I'll start with you. What are your thoughts on tomorrow? Key matchups, what are you looking for? Yeah, I think the Caravan matchup actually matters quite a bit because in the second half of the last game, when Butler was actually had success in the first half, UConn ran a lot of Caravan at the five, and Butler had no match. So uh, if he's healthy, I think he is a severe matchup problem, especially with Klingon on the floor, because Butler, I think where you can put Telford on Caravan, then it's like, all right, who guards Castle, who guards Spencer, especially in all the off-ball action UConn runs. It's like, that's just going to cause problems. Uh, UConn's also a very good offensive rebounding team. Butler not great on the defensive board so the clinging key is big uh this is also a bad spot game for butler just you're coming off of an emotional win in omaha you know i gotta go to wherever the hell yukon plays one of the seven yukon home gyms hartford connecticut it's literally the capital but i guess is this one in hartford or is this one in stores or is this one in trumbull westport or south shout out frank in general could be madison square garden or the biggies you know you never know yeah uh all all of that said i i am i just hope butler does enough to like not kill their metrics in this one um you can yeah uh, i'm fiddling with the things to like make myself smile because i think butler's just gonna i think this one could get ugly fellas i'm not gonna lie uh i don't totally disagree talking about that defense too uh, a couple other things davis lit up the court like dj was killing it in the first half but it was pretty evident what UConn's plan was right they were like we're gonna go after DJ because they have a size advantage it is what it is I mean he was he, he was targeted so uh I think they got in his head a little bit maybe the second half and um unfortunately didn't have quite the same results um uh BFC what about you man what are your what are your thoughts for tomorrow and then um uh, key matchups or, or points of emphasis yeah I think the biggest thing and we saw it uh, like you said in the second half um, of the last game. Hurley's just, he, I mean, he's a great coach, as we know, national championship coach. DJ Davis was having his way with, with Cam Spencer um, offensively in the first half. I mean, he was, ex- he was honestly exposing him that entire half. And then they just, he made just kind of subtle adjustments 
like you said, to kind of attack him on, on defense. And then they switched Castle onto him and Castle's length really kind of threw him off. Um, so I'm really wondering, I think this is going to be a pretty phenomenal coaching matchup just because both these guys have now seen a competitive game um, against one another. I know that Thad respects the hell out of UConn. He was on with Dockage today and was talking about how UConn just makes every play they need to make. And we saw it. I mean, 45 seconds really determined that that first matchup where they went on a 7-0 run in 45 seconds and it went from Butler up six to down one. And then we never we never saw the lead again. Now, if, if we have that again and we somehow are up and a 7-0 uh, run decides it, I'm, I'm a happy camper. Um, but I think we're going to see a lot of adjustments in this one. I think it's going to be I think it's going to be a coaching battle just because the, the Klingon matchup is going to be a problem. I think that Telfort really has to get into his body and get him into foul trouble. <clears throat> but other than that, I think, you know, that DJ matchup interests me. Uh, Brooks, that that matchup kind of interests me. We're just going to have to get hot, but I think it is going to be an interesting matchup with this being the second test. But obviously the Klingon in addition is is a killer, especially against Butler. Thomas has been has been playing great, um, but Klingon's a, a mismatch for basically anybody in the conference. Yeah, and uh, a couple other stats from the, the Butler side um, in the last game. Davis had 22, Brooks had 19. I remember, this was when Telfort was going through a little bit of his struggle. Um, he had 16, so uh, a, a more locked-in Telfort is obviously huge from an offensive standpoint for us. Uh, Kyle, how about you, man? I mean, yeah, it's just – it, it's a, it it, it kind of talks to how highly I feel about UConn when I say that, like, I just don't really – I can see where we stay in this game. I really find it hard to talk myself into believing that we can win this. I would easily – I talked myself before the Creighton game, even though I didn't predict us to win. I talked myself into thinking we can win this game. Same with the Marquette game. We won both. Fantastic. We almost didn't win both. But the truth is, is that neither of those games we were projected to win – you know, and for good reason, because Creighton and Marquette are great teams. I can't really talk myself or think myself into finding a way to win this game. Just when I think, when I use my head, the you, I feel like UConn's in a different spot than they were when we played them last time. When we played them last time, UConn was in the spot of they're a really good team, but they had lost to Seton Hall recently. You know, they, uh, you know, UNC kept it close against them. They looked really good. They didn't look invincible. Right now, they look damn near invincible. They just like, I don't know. Like, I mean, I'll say this again. I, this is a Butler pod. You know, I think UConn is just the clear cut number one team in the country right now. Like I watched the Purdue game, Purdue game yesterday. And I really just, I think Purdue's fantastic. I think UConn's on a different level, just basketball wise. And just the way they run their sets, everything, it's a beauty, beauty beautiful to watch. For Butler, I think this relies on getting hot, simply making your shots. You have to make, you just have to make shots. And then on top of that, we have to double, we're going to have to double clean in because, you know, he's just too dynamic in the post. And I think that that's going to present real issues because, you know, you can't even leave Castle nowadays. And I hate sounding so doom and gloom about this, but I just think it's going to be a really tough matchup for us. That being said, you know, this Butler team has surprised us before. I still think it's very possible that we can keep it close. I think 16 and a half is a wild line, you know, even for um, even for a team this good. I absolutely think we can cover that. Um, I'm super excited to see the way Butler goes at this because I think this game is more about keeping momentum and positive energy and continuing to play well, really, into a really important homestand that we have. Um, it's so possible to come out of this game losing by nine or 10 and still feeling really, really good about where Butler is, um, you know, going into the next few games. Yeah, my uh, a big thing for me that I was going to tweet it out tomorrow is let's not make this like a, a you know, if Butler loses this game, you know, there's going to be the idiots online. They're like, the team is going down the shit and we're done, right? Like, Guys, it's the number one team in the country. If you lose by 15 to 20 against UConn, I mean, I'm sorry. It it can happen, right? It shit. Xavier lost by 43. Like, I don't obviously let's not do that. Let's not kill our metrics. But like, let's let, tomorrow's game. I hope they keep it competitive. I would love to win. That'd be awesome. We can be realistic and say this is the best team in the country. It's gonna be 
damn near impossible. Not not impossible, obviously, but it's, it's gonna be tough. So let's not do the whole like, oh gosh, Butler's falling down the tank thing. That's just so stupid. I will say, I can't remember what the final line was on the Michigan State game. Did it ever get to double digits? I can't remember. Um, I think it, like, it did. It, I think it did too. I think it got to like 10 and a half, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. Damn it. I, it I was going to say, I was going to say, I can't remember if it's, I was going to say Butler is undefeated as double digit underdogs, but I can't, I, but now I, if Michigan State was, then that would not be. Yeah, 10 and a hook. I, it ended up being 10F. 10 and a hook on some books. Yeah. Mostly 10. All right. Well, close enough. I'm going to call it nine and a half and say that they're undefeated against double digits. Uh, underdogs and is it under, uh, double digit underdog? Number two, if you were a bird uh, and you were and you're welcoming Butler to your stadium, I'd be very afraid because uh, Blue Jays and Golden Eagles. Um, yeah, we we took care of that. But um, all right, prediction time. Let's uh, let's start off with our good friends at Biggie's Barroom. After hearing all of that, let's start with Tyler. What is your prediction? Final score tomorrow. What are you seeing happening tomorrow? UConn ninety. Butler 74. Um, Butler continues to score the ball well. Um, I think that they're going to hit their shots. They're going to be hyped up, I think, coming into tomorrow. Um, to be clear, this is where my area of expertise isn't great. Is Posh playing tomorrow? So there's no Butler, idea. But yeah, Butler keeps that stuff super good. I can confirm that DJ Davis is playing, but I cannot confirm. Uh, actually, I know Ryan, <laughs> we confirmed that at the same time. Uh, but uh but I cannot confirm if, yeah, if Posh playing. I will he, say he wasn't, in a, he wasn't in a boot. He wasn't in a boot, which people are like, well, he wasn't in a boot before the Creighton game. But I don't think they just like put him in a boot during the Creighton game and then just take it off. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that's a good sign. But um, I don't know. I do feel like UConn does sometimes struggle, especially Tristan Newton against more physical guards. And Posh Alexander can really get into you. So, I mean, that obviously makes a huge difference if, you know, your point guard's playing. I, I think that. Butler has an opportunity to do something. We've seen them upset Marquette and Creighton on the road. Um, they're not going to be afraid. I think they're a very mature team. They're going to go in there. They know what the job is. They're not going to be overwhelmed by going in to play the number one team in the country. I'd be shocked if they did pull a Xavier and lose by 40. Um, you know, I think that they're going to, you're going to see a very competent basketball team. That's just a tier below where UConn is right now. Yeah. Brian. Yeah, I largely agree. Um, Butler struggles defensively, and they're going on the road to play the third best offense in the country, according to Ken Palm. It's just a really tough matchup for them. I mean, UConn's a really tough matchup for everybody right now. Um, I will mention, because it's a Butler pod, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, because they're playing in Hartford, it's widely considered much less of a home court advantage than when they play on campus in stores. So they won't be able to rely on that as much, but I'm guessing they're they're not going to really need it. I'm going to say 85 to 70 UConn. All right. All right. Uh, Michael, I don't know what you just got so excited about, but you're next. Well, you know, it's the Butler advantage of making sure you play games in like teams like inferior courts. That, yeah. That's that, that goes, that goes a long way. You can win <laughs> games like that. That's plus EV. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think this is actually a lower scoring game than both, uh, Cassidy's think I think this game I lean under I think it's going to be a much slower paced game I think UConn's going to really control the tempo I don't think Butler's going to be able to get out and run especially if Posh isn't playing too since they're not as deep they might want to slow it down a little bit which they did not do in the Creighton game that maybe they just do the exact opposite I love this little TV thing I have uh I'm gonna go UConn 79 Butler 62 all right BFC how about you man yeah I I kind of agree uh I think it might not be as high scoring, especially as, as the Creighton game. Um, but I think we, we keep it a little bit closer. I think maybe like 84, 70, 74. Okay, like 10, like 10 points. I don't think they'll walk on, see the court or anything like that. I think, I think it's a fairly competitive game. UConn did not play well against Providence, so I'm not going to put too much into that. Um, but I do think Butler, especially with no Hopkins, is a better team than Providence. Um, but I think it's, I think it ends up a little bit similar to that. Yeah. Oh, you got. Yeah. I mean, I'll, uh, I'll say that th this team's whole mentality has, has, you know, been a uh, Butler uh, has been a very, very big, like not scared of anyone. I agree uh, with, um, with the point that Butler's just not, they're not going to play this scared. Uh, they're going to have a game plan. They're going to, I think, execute, you know, I hate to say as well as anyone against UConn because, you know, some teams have kept it really close and even Seton Hall, um, 
you know, was able to beat them and, and all that. I, I think that that I think that Butler will execute as good as they can against this team. I don't think it's going to be like some sort of – I don't think it's going to look like the Xavier game. I really don't. I don't think Xavier's a terrible team. I think that UConn really overwhelmed them for whatever reason. I think that um, Butler will not embarrass themselves, but I think it'll probably be around the spread. I'll say it's a 15-point game. I'll say 80-65. to 65. I think Butler probably struggles to score a little bit in this game. Um, but, again, I don't think that this is going to be some sort of – uh, swamping, uh, like the Xavier game. Um, but like, like was said, uh, UConn's just on a different tier right now, which is no insult to Butler. Um, so for the guys that have said that we're going to score in the sixties, just an FYI that Butler has only scored in the sixties once his entire Big East season. Um, and it was there is a win 69, 62 against Marquette. So I don't think we score in the 60s. We score. It's just what Butler does. They they don't – like, they take a bunch of energy. They put it on offense. It doesn't matter. I mean, they will literally score, and then they'll let you walk right down, back down the court and score on them. So um, I think it's going to be a little higher. I think it's going to be – I think UConn scores. I think it's going to be I'm, – I'm kind of similar to Ryan a little bit. I think it's going to be, like, maybe, like, 87, 72, 73, something like that. Um I think we stay kind of yeah, right inside that range of like that 15, 16 mark, I think is where we end up sticking. Uh, I do love the mentality of this team, which is uh, we had that interview with Jalen Thomas early on. And he talked about how um, during the Big East um, media day, you know, uh, Thad looked at him and him and John laughed and said, you know, they picked us. They can't believe they picked us 10th or something like that. Um, the quote was awesome. And, and I think that that they really have taken on this underdog mentality I know Michael says it's a bad game for them. I don't think this team is really – I don't think – I think this is a team that's going to be mentally focused on every single game. I just think that they have that – under again, that underdog mentality. They want it. Um, whether or not the skill level can get you there, obviously, is a different story. But I think that they will be prepared to fight um, just like they have any other game. So, um, so I think we're all riding UConn. That's not that surprising because they're the number one team in the country. So, <laughs> kind of a given. Um, I did um, – I want to see if Michael and Tyler, do you have any last things you guys want to say to each other before we log off? Oh, Brian, you got something you want to say? Yeah, I got a question since yeah. I'm here with all my Butler friends. Yeah. Was the Ryan Cockburner play dirty? <laughs> yes. Yes, it was absolutely. It's dirty. on site. It's on site. With <laughs> he's, he, I'm, I just, I, I'm just letting you know that he's, I, I, I like, I've heard the, I don't think it was a like Grace and Allen level thing. I don't think he needed to do it. He could have just hugged the body like everyone else does. He went for the face. It was a dirty play. I will not hear differently. And he is going to hear it at Hinkle in a couple of weeks. He's going to hear it. It is a lot harder than you guys seem to think it is that to intentionally poke someone in the eye. It is okay. incredible. I don't think he intentionally poked him in the eye. I think he went for his face. I think he just went for the ball, man. He He's a I, big man with slow reactions. He tried to get a ball over someone who's like twice as fast as he is. I don't. I got to be honest. Michael. Michael. Michael, we're trying to make the environment for the Creighton game good. Come on, man. Oh, my. Be, you, should, I, you should still be able to yell at Big Softy. That's not, that's not a problem. <laughs> I got to be honest. I think that, yeah, I think uh, I kind of agree with Michael a little bit on this one. I was like, in quick time, it's it's kind of like with, with all that bullshit when it's like roughing the passer. It's like, how the hell are you going to stop yourself? Like some of those times, it's kind of the same way. Like maybe you should have just hugged him. I think he was – DJ did have the ball here – in the replays, everyone that slowed it down, it made it look like he went straight for his eyes. I will say this about Kalkbrenner, and and I do watch a bunch of Big East basketball. I've never seen someone that looks so, like, sad on the court. It's, like, insane. I, I mean, he looks depressed. And it's just weird. Like, I, he was going for a free throw, and I was like, why are you going to cry? It was the weirdest thing. Um, that was one of my I think the Telfort play was dirtier. Yeah, you're not going to get my benefit of the doubt when you literally did a dirty play on Telfort, like, 30 seconds early. The Telfort play was dirtier. That, Maybe that, that, he does it. He does it every single every screen he throws is illegal. They could call it every time. Speaking of crying, I almost cried there for a second. Thank God that was not a significant injury because if Telfort went down with an ACL, kiss our season goodbye. Um, and if Trey Alexander doesn't dribble the ball off his foot, it would have been a lot of tears in uh, Indianapolis. Uh, oh, not, no, we won. We won, man. And, and I love the way that we intentionally bounced the ball around with the five seconds left. That was really smart of us. Well played. We didn't want to get the ball. Why well, keep shooting free throws when you can milk the whole clock on a random <laughs> scramble? I like that a lot better. In, in, uh, in conclusion, in conclusion, suspend Ryan Kalkbrenner for the season. 
Yeah, you told him. I totally agree. That might make him cry. <laughs> yeah. But uh, all right, boys. Well, uh, awesome pod as always. Uh, appreciate Biggie's Bar Room for stopping on with those guys. Um, really looking forward to the game tomorrow. It should be a fun one. Um, I believe the game's at 8.30 tomorrow. For those of you that are listening, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time, FS1. Um, Butler, 15-7, and 6-5 and five in the Big East. Looking for another big win over number one UConn, who I believe is 20-2. and two. Uh, And what? Uh, where are they in the Big East now? 9-1? 9-1 or 10-1. Say they're oh, going to yeah. win the Big East because they're going to. Yeah, yeah. The winners of the Big East, basically, right? So, um, anyway, uh, this is a Butler podcast, so I'm sorry to you guys, but uh, go dogs.